You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, J.T. Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Thor, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories. We've got a fantastic show for you today. But before we get into that, I'd like to tell you about a couple of sponsors who make the show possible each and every day. Craig Allenson has a brand new book. It's a spinoff of the Expeditionary Force uh, series, Expeditionary Force Mavericks, book one, Death Trap. The human soldiers stranded on the planet Paradise have been recruited into an alien legion to do the dirty jobs that the high-tech species won't do. Their first mission is to kick the enemy off a backwater planet no one cares about. It's a simple assignment, except everyone has a hidden agenda and the planet could become a death trap. Craig Allenson's brand new book, Death Trap. Also thanks to Ernie Lindsay with his Sarah series, the psychological thriller series that begins with Sarah has books one through three and a bonus novella, single mother, successful executive, target for revenge. The psychological thriller series box set Sarah Winthrop's world is thrown headlong into a whirlwind of chaos along with her family, friends, and colleagues by unseen enemies seeking revenge. Those lurking in the shadows clawing for vengeance will go to any lengths, any lengths. It's likely never occurred to them that they may have just messed with the wrong woman. The Sarah series. Books 1 through 3 in a bonus novella by Ernie Lindsay. Also, John L. Monk with the Jenkins Cycle. From book 1, Kick, a supernatural thriller. They say suicides are damned for eternity, but if possessing the bodies of violent criminals is hell, then Dan Jenkins will take it. And he does every time a portal arrives to whisk him from his ghostly exile. Normally, before the villain returns to kick him out, Dan dishes out a final serving of justice and leaves the world a safer place. It's one of the rules if he wants more rides, and he's happy to oblige. For a part-time dead guy, it's a pretty good gig. And then he meets her. Kick is the first book in a series of supernatural thrillers. If you like Quantum Leap and Every Day, you'll love this gritty and original take on the body-hopping hero story. Vividly written, Kick is a wild ride with a sharp, sarcastic wit and a flawed yet likable main character. From John L. Monk, The Jenkins Cycle, Book 1, Kick. And from M.D. Massey, Invasion, Zombie Apocalypse. The action-packed first novel in M.D. Massey's Them Zombie Apocalypse series. When a surprise nuclear attack forces Aiden from hiding, he finds the world to be a much different place and more deadly. Now he'll traverse a post-apocalyptic landscape populated by violent redneck looters, rogue military factions, and an army of hungry undead. After two combat tours in the Middle East, Aiden Sullivan just wants to be left alone on his family's ranch in the Texas Hill Country. But when the bombs fall and the dead walk, Aiden risks life and limb to rescue his aging parents from the zombie horde. To save them, he'll traverse half the state of Texas while fighting rogue military units, violent redneck looters, and thousands of walking dead. The question is, can he make it there in time? Only one thing's for sure, this ranger will complete the mission or he'll die trying. M.D. Massey's Invasion Zombie Apocalypse. Now on to our show. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Bev Thomas on the show with me today. Her brand new book, A Good Enough Mother, uh, just launched today as we're recording this, so it's been out for a few days when you're hearing it. Uh, This is a phenomenal book, and I'll tell you what, for for a debut novel, this this is amazing. Uh, Welcome to the show, Bev. Oh, thank you very much. That's lovely. What a lovely lead-in. Thank you. <laughs> well, Beth, <laughs> we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, that's really interesting. Um, I do remember when I was at uh, primary school, so that's sort of, uh, what's the equivalent of that in the States? That's kind of under... 
uh, nine, so pre nine. In fact, it was um, I think it was about seven. I do I do remember there was a school teacher who lived opposite, and I wrote a little story. Uh, and posted it through his letterbox. <laughs> so I was kind of really interested in writing. Uh, and then I kind of went away from it and went into a whole sort of career into psychology. So I feel like I've kind of come full circle in my um, in my world. Uh, but I really remember writing a little story and him marking it, not so much marking it, but being really encouraging and saying, oh, I think you should carry on with this. So oh, that's my memory. I, I love to hear that. Um, I I love it when when people have a memory of uh, of someone recognizing the the gift or talent yeah. or or whatever you want to call it because you know there there are a lot of dark days uh, in a writer's life where the story uh, just seems impossible yeah. and there are always those little pieces of encouragement we can draw back mm. on so i love that mm. um were you a big, that- i'm sorry go ahead i was just going to say i think that's a really interesting point because i i think that my journey you know, I've I've written a lot that hasn't made it into, you know, the world of, you know, publication at all. And I, I think sometimes those, uh, I've been on courses and just being recognized by a tutor or having encouragement by somebody or being kind of seen in inverted commas uh, for your writing. Uh, it's just, these things are so important if you're not, if you're not actually kind of recognized publicly as a writer. Um I think you have to keep writing, but it's quite difficult. As you say, dark days, it's, it's true. If, 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 if nothing feels like it's happening, it is sometimes quite difficult to, to keep going. So my, my experience in those years was courses, you know, getting feedback from other students, um, you know, really enjoying the process. But I think it's really hard just to be on your own in a room writing. I, I, I don't think I could have managed that and carried on if that had just been me. Right. It really is so important, and it really... Um reminds us that even though writing feels like a solitary endeavor, um, you know, ultimately it's a connection between the reader and the writer. And, uh, exactly. I, yeah, the, that's, it's those little reminders that mean so much. Yeah, um, no, completely. And I think, you know, that, that's hence if you've got a sort of readership of a creative writing group, you know, right. I think it's really helpful to get feedback. You know, I think that, you know, one one time over the years, my mistake was just hiding off, you know, in solitarily writing something and then going, da-da, and of course, you know, it didn't work. You know, I, I do think there's the sort of input, for, for, for me anyway, the input from readers over the over the journey has been really important. Absolutely. Um, were you a big reader as a kid? Yes, I was. I mean, we did have a, um, my dad was a real reader, so we did have kind of, uh, every available space was turned into books. It was kind of, you know, stuffed with um, books. So he was. We, we were a kind of. We did read a lot, but I also. Um, I, it really sort of stayed with me. Something that um, uh, I, I read in. I think it was the, the Stephen King book on writing. I mean, he talks about his frustrations when students come and they really want to be writers and you know be published. And he says, "Oh, what have you been reading?" And they say, "Well, nothing. I don't really read." <laughs> and um, I, I think it's really fundamental. You know, I, I do think you need to write a lot, and I do think you need to read a lot. So I, I, t- I really, I think his advice is fantastic for that. That you know, it's crafting, learning how to craft something. You often have to just do lots of reading. Sometimes that's working out how you don't want to do it, and sometimes it's really sort of hats off admiration of how other people have pulled something off. So I think it's really fundamental. Exactly. Um, You mentioned a minute ago that uh, there came a point where you started uh, studying psychology and and your your interest shifted a bit. Um, Tell us about that. What drew you to to wanting to study there and and what was it that uh, – what what was the draw, I guess? Well, I was doing um, – I was actually doing – English and I did switch to psychology and I do think there's something really I mean there is a sort of real parallel between um, writing and books and therapy even though it might not seem so obvious but I mean I do think there is something about you know partly people come with an issue or a difficulty and part of the journey is helping them tell their own stories so I mean the the world of therapy in my view is a lot about stories Um, you know there's a beginning there's a middle and end you know, you are helping someone to facilitate that journey. So I think I got very interested initially in, um, I was in the library and I saw a book on groups and group dynamics. And in fact, then I switched um, to psychology and did it. I mean, there happened to be a university which had a fantastic course. And so I just got really hooked, hooked into that. But 
I, I, now I've come back into writing and telling story, I can see how how linked they are really. I mean, the, the, the whole process of stories is really, you know, part of part of the therapeutic domain. And I guess, it, you know, Freud, you know, arguably Freud, you know, some people would say that his some of his early case study writings read like sort of detective stories. You know, there right. is a kind of there's a there's a mystery to unravel somehow, isn't there? A kind of why am I here? What what's the problem? How do I kind of solve it? There's something to be kind of unravelled or get to the bottom of. Well, I'm um, I'm glad you uh, you've referenced that uh, from Stephen King about reading and writing, and and those really are the two fundamental things that you need to do to be a writer. You need to read widely. You need to write as much as you can. Uh, but I like to add a third to that, and that is talking with people. Um, you know, studying human relationships, studying how people talk, how they in, engage with one yeah. another, and uh, and yeah. it's like it's like you took that and went professional with it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there, there's yeah. nothing, you know. No, no, I, that's true. Yeah. That uh, how do it, you? F- it's really interesting. Yeah, go on. Sorry. No, 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 no. I don't hear. I want to hear what you have to say. Well, I, I was going to say a um, couple of people have said um, in some of these publicity um, conversations. Oh, it's really carefully plotted your book, and how did you did you sit down and plot it? And of course, I can see now looking at it that it is carefully plotted, but it wasn't carefully plotted. As in when I wrote it, my 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 decisions came utterly from the characters' psychology. So my questions to all of my characters, obviously in this book, predominantly Ruth, was, "What's the very worst thing that could happen to this person in this situation?" Oh, okay, she's missing her son, so she's got to see somebody who looks like her son. So all the time, the decisions were about the characters' psychology. Um, Hello, Bev. The plot. Oh. Yeah. Oh. I'm sorry, you dropped out for just a second. Um, th- could you repeat that last sentence for me, please? I'm sorry. Yeah. So, so it had to, from my point of view, the characters themselves had to make psychological sense, and that's what drove the plot, rather than the other way around. I did not want to have a plot that the characters had to fit into. It just didn't work that way for me. Maybe that's because I come at it from a different perspective from the psycho psychology understanding of it but that to me you know I, I think that's what makes me satisfied when I get to the end of a book I kind of think yeah these people make sense to me I, I get them I believe them I find it frustrating if I get to the end I think why how would that person do that I don't believe they would really do that so for me it had to come from the characters first right right um what type of practice did you go into in terms of my You're clinical psych- work yes Psychology, yeah. So I, I then, after university, I, I did a master's in clin- clinical psychology, and I worked in, I'm not sure what the equivalent would be in the States, but we worked, um, there, were, there was a setup of psychological therapy within um, general practice, so in primary care. So in, in, in um, the UK, we'd have general practitioners, GPs that you'd see who would be your kind of family physician, doctor, and we would be offering a psychological services from from within those practice, um, you, you know, w- within the um, centres themselves. So I worked there for a number of number of years. Um, obviously, in your training, you do lots of different placements in family, um, uh, and adult, and all, all sorts of things. And at the end of that um, process, so I worked for a number of years, and then after that, um, I decided to move into organisational work. So I work now with staff teams in mental health services so i kind of support carers and um you know people who work on the front line really to help them think about some of the complex work that they do that's fantastic Uh, as a natural born storyteller um when you are um working with people and maybe after a session or you know after you're uh working with someone uh, did you ever find yourself imagining um how this person's story might play out or, um, you know, it kind of injecting your creative uh, abilities into this real life situation that's just unfolded in front of you? Well, I, I didn't really. I mean, at the time when I was working, I was very much sort of immersed in the in the work. So I wasn't I wasn't writing at all at that time. It was only when I 
started moving into organisation work and I, I actually went travelling. I, I sort of did a round the world travelling um, chunk of time in, in, in between. And um, it was when I was away, I came across a book called um, Writing Down the Bones by Natalie Goldberg. I don't know if you've come across that. Um, but she talks about writing and the sort of writing process. And it sort of triggered something for me. So in some ways, by that stage, I'd left doing kind of individual therapy um, and I was moving into something else. But that, then I started writing, you know, just little bits here and there, really. And I, I think I was very interested in, as you said, the third thing is, you know, listening to what people do and what motivates them. And how do we make sense of how do we make sense of people and what we do and why do people do what they do? And very often, I think that ordinary ordinary people do really extraordinary things, don't they? Good and bad. You know, right. I think it's quite fascinating. You know, it doesn't have to be. I mean, it could be one or the other. You just think, how has that happened? And sometimes it's really unfathomable. Well, and and what's strange is that people do extraordinary things, good and bad, like you say, uh, and and their motivations are, uh, you know, standing outside the way we see them can be completely different from the way they see them. Um, we yeah. see that play out in, in, you know, even down to, to superhero movies where uh, a villain is the hero of their own story. And you get to really deal with these mm. complex, um, you know, ways yeah. that people see themselves in the world. It's really fascinating. Yes. And I was also interested in that in, in this book and exploring, you know, multi-layered complexities. You know, I mean, obviously it's a book about motherhood. It's also a book about grief it's a book about therapy and psychological and mental health i don't think there's i don't think there's easy answers to any of those things and i guess what i wanted to try and do by writing it was to sort of lay things out there for people to also think about um it's not i don't think in writing it i'm saying i think it's black and white about this this and this you know it, this it's complex stuff isn't it i think yeah you know, one of the most cliche questions that uh, writers get asked is, where do you get your ideas from? And it's it's one of those silly questions because uh, ideas are everywhere. And uh, yeah. you know, as a writer, they're, they're surrounding us. And uh, But there is something interesting about the idea that becomes kind of capital T, the idea, um, that kind of floats mm -hmm. a little higher than the rest. Um, when a, mm. when a story idea starts coming to you, and, and your new book, uh, A Good Enough Mother, um, when when you when the story starts unfolding for you, what comes first? Is it a is it a character that comes alive? Is it a, uh, is it a premise that you start kind of rolling over in your mind? Is it uh, yeah. you know, a newspaper headline? How does it usually come to life? I think for me, it's the sort of emotional driver. So um, I was. For, and for this book, it was grief and loss. So I think for me, I was trying to, I sort of flirted with that theme in other sorts of story settings. And I just hadn't really found a way to pull it off or, you know, do it satisfactorily. Um, so I was kind of interested in it anyway. And I think, um, so for me, the theme is kind of floating around. The, when I say the theme, I mean the kind of emotional driver um, and then once I found the sort of potential character to put it into, then, then, I, then that's when I sort of start asking the character these sorts of psychological questions. What would happen if, what, what would be the worst thing that could happen? What would be, you know, because obviously if it's a story where, you know, she sees this person, then she refers them on and I mean, there's no story. So, or if she was really sorted and, you know, so in some ways, I think you're kind of constantly putting obstacles, emotional obstacles up against your character in order to make the story interesting and work and challenging and challenge the reader into thinking, oh, what would I do if I was in that situation? Or, you know, she's really done a bad thing here. Or maybe I would have done that. You know, I, I like that. I like being I like to think that myself when I read books. I kind of like to think well I, I can't imagine doing that or maybe I could you know so I think that's right. my question always is what what's the emotional sort of journey and how can it play out the uh the character of Ruth Hartland uh is uh Ruth is a psychotherapist um I think a, a lot of readers will assume 
that writers put themselves into their books. And the truth Mm -hmm. is, most of the time we do, uh, but a lot of times it's not where readers expect it to be. Uh, I think little pieces of us show up all over the book, and and sometimes it's not the most obvious place that you would assume. Um, When writing a character like Ruth, who has so much in common with you, um, how do you... Well, let me ask you this. Do you feel like it's a benefit um, that you uh, do have the personal real life experience or do you find yourself having to be cautious because you have such real life experience there to separate yourself from Ruth? Hmm. I mean, I, I think my my way of sort of being able to write this was in some ways to be very clear with myself that the the bit that I kind of know well is the world. So I could write very kind of effectively about the process, the sort of therapy, the what, what a clinic is like, you know, the demands of um, the public sector, et cetera, et cetera. These are things that I sort of have internalized. But what, of course, is the fun bit, really, I think, as a writer, is then the kind of imaginative creation of all of the characters. So I had to sort of create Ruth and then look at her as a sort of person objectively i.e. someone who wasn't me, what would she, what would I do if I were Ruth in that situation? What would I do if I had lost or my child was missing who was 17? And of course, you know, I haven't had a missing child. I, you know, I, I can't, I don't know, but one can try and draw on what you think you would feel like. So I think that's the really fun bit of writing is that you're kind of creating these people and you're, you're making demands and questions of them in order to be able to write them. And I, I think your answer about, you know, a question about, where are writers in everything, you know, and I think there's a constant fascination, isn't there, of, you know, what bits you and what's not you and all the rest of it. And, you know, I think that myself when I read um, things, but I, I think we we'll probably weave ourselves into, as you say, all, all of the characters in bits, but not in ways that would ever, people would ever be able to kind of identify somehow. I and mean, I think it's kind of sometimes it can be, um, a decision that somebody makes, maybe that's influenced by you. But I, I, I think that's, in a way, that's the fun bit for me, is the sort of, you know, it's not a non-fiction book. You know, there's lots of books in psychology which are non-fiction and there's ways of doing them. What what was such a sort of liberating thing for me here was to sort of have a world that I knew that I didn't have to do that much research about, but then to create these people and move them around in it. So it was such a sort of liberating joy to be able to do that in in a place that I was very familiar with. Ruth is uh, uh, is brought up against a situation in the book where uh, she has a new patient who, uh, who strikes her uh, in a way that, uh, that kind of rattles her, her existence. Tell us about what happens with Dan and, and what this does uh, for Ruth, please. Yeah. So, so uh, you know, right from the sort of opening um, p- part of the book, you know, she she um, she thinks this new person who's in the waiting room is her missing son, um, Tom. And, you know, there's a kind of moment where she absolutely believes um, it's him because she states in the book, he, you know, he looks so similar. He's wearing, wearing the same clothes. And then when she realizes it isn't him, of course, she has, She's kind of mourning that uh, uh, in that moment that, you know, she thought he, 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 it was him. So I guess from that point onwards, we see somebody who is, I mean, there's a sort of perfect storm in some ways between the two of them. So she's sort of missing, she's, she's sort of looking for a, a son. And of course, as it slowly turns out, as we find more and more about Dan Griffin, the client, that he is also, he has a challenging backstory and in many ways he's also looking for a mother so it's a sort of perfect storm of the two of them coming together um and as we find out sort of more about him she gets more and more pulled in but i think it's not just that he looks like her son i mean or does he but anyway in the beginning he looks like her son it's it's also um it's also that sense that you know she hasn't been able to sort of you know, do what she wanted to do and sort of save and sort out and rescue her own son in the way that she might have wanted to. So I guess she's projecting something kind of into that moment. It's not just that he looks like, she thinks he looks like it. it it's what, how can I kind of rescue this person? I think it taps into all those 
very powerful feelings for her. And then, of course, you know, she gets pulled in a, in a way that blurs her professional and personal boundary in a way that's unhelpful to many in, concerned. Well, what's interesting is that you learn fairly quickly that that the story that you think this book is is not that story. Um, if If the things that you've mentioned already, if those things were necessarily true or are they um we're not saying um you know yeah. that would you would you would let us off the hook a little easier but no this is this is a, a story that makes us go deep uh with ruth and and with dan mm. and it becomes a different kind of story this is an, an interesting blend of of like a family drama with yeah. Uh, what is some of the best psychological thrillers that we've had in the last few years? Um, it was is that a conscious effort as you're writing? Did you uh, did you intend for this book to be uh, to to hit certain genre notes, or is this just how the story unfolded for you? I think it's how the story unfolded. I mean, I think I was very aware as well that you know I I you know I think I wanted to explore certain kind of emotional themes and. Um, so I was very clear about that, but I also had in mind, you know, people want to read a book that they are, they want to get to the end of, you know, I think it, right. you can't just explore a kind of emotional landscape and, you know, it, and hope that people will stay with you. So I, I guess I was trying to, without it being necessarily conscious, I was thinking, how can I manage to bring those two things together? Because I really love, I really love a story you know, I really love being taken on a journey, but I also want more than, you know, A happens, B happens, C happens, D happens. I, it just loses my interest psychologically if I don't believe in my characters. You know, I don't have to, I, you don't have to like the characters, but I do think you have to believe in the choices that they make, even if sometimes you think they're wrong. Do you see what I mean? So I think sure. I was very keen to kind of try and bring those two things um, together because, you know, ultimately there's there's... <laughs> hundreds of books to choose out there you, you know you want people to engage with yours and you want to read it but you also want to kind of leave people with something i hope to think about and it certainly feels already that um you know m my sense of book clubs here in the uk uh, i was at an event yesterday and obviously it's just come out just three weeks before the u.s publication at, um at the end of, of uh, april is that there's lots to talk about you know people have reactions to it both about parenting about being a family um about psychological health you know there's, there's kind of they seem to be saying there's lots to talk about which is great the the title a good enough mother is a really loaded title um what does yeah. that mean um to you and and what are you hoping to uh to pique our interest with with that title well yes it's sort of um it's, it's there's, there's two ways of reading it and, and i guess um that's deliberate i mean it is drawn from um the uh psychoanalyst winnicott who coins the phrase a good enough mother um and he what he was meaning by that which i think is really was very innovative at the time and i still i still think is really innovative what he was saying is that you know it isn't about uh perfection and perfect parenting because actually that doesn't do our children any good what, what he was advocating is that it is about being good enough and by that he meant you know being able to allow your child in some ways to experience the imperfections of motherhood and being mothered you know not obviously when they're tiny babies when they need you at every second but you know as you go through experiencing that so in order that as they get older they are able to internalize that and become adults that are well-rounded and kind of accepting of the frustrations of life because it isn't all rosy out there <laughs> so I, I guess what he was saying is you know allow allow that and 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 of course in my character Ruth Hartland well she has twins so one fares kind of seems to find life quite easy and Tom doesn't and I, I think one of the things that she really struggles to do is to allow him just to be himself because some of that is quite unbearable to her so in a way she tries to do she tries to over parent she tries to kind of make him something that he's not whereas maybe you know partly I, I guess we're all talking about the ability to stand back however painful it is if someone's miserable or unhappy or you know it isn't really our job to kind of 
stop them feeling that. And I think that's what she ends up doing. So in a way, you know, she isn't a good enough mother in Winnicott's uh, kind of meaning of it. She she just tries to kind of overdo it, if that makes sense. Right, right. Well, Bev, the, uh, you know, for a debut novel, this is absolutely fantastic. I think people are going to love A Good Enough Mother. Uh, we're going to put links to it in the show notes uh, where everyone can go buy their copy. Uh, what are you working right. on now? Um, after after releasing a book like this, uh, is is there pressure to follow it up with uh, with a new release? Um, well, I, I mean, I I feel in in many ways, having written sort of rather aimlessly for quite a long time, I think in <laughs> in, in, in a funny sort of way, it's um it's given me great confidence. Uh, so I, I don't feel oh dear the sort of the terror of the. The, ne- the next book, in some ways, I think it's a sort of real relief that um, that I can I can produce another one. Do, do, does that make sense? I feel it's sort of opposite in some ways. I mean, who knows? I could be I could be <laughs> talking to you in six months' time, going, "Yeah, uh, you remember that thing I said?" Um, but at the moment, <laughs> it feels uh, at the moment it feels um, a, a really lovely place to be. I feel really proud of it. I, I hope it. I hope it does well. I hope people talk about it. But also, it is what it is, isn't it? It's, you finish this and it's out there, and yep. I have no kind of control over it now. But I think it, it, I'm looking forward to, you know, I, I have started work on something, tentative steps into something new, and at the moment I'm feeling really looking forward to actually the process of, of, of writing and doing some more reading and just having a bit of quieter time, you know, post all the buzz of everything. So, yeah, I, I'm looking forward to it. Well, we're going to keep uh, looking to see what's next from you. And, and uh, if, if that happens again, um, please stop by and, and talk with us again. I'd love to. Thank you so much. It's been yeah. so lovely talking to you. You too. Bev, if people are just learning about you and want to know more, uh, is there a place online where they can connect with you? Well, I'm in the process of doing an author um, website at the moment. So at the moment, my um, Twitter is probably the best place for messages or comments or through the publisher um, but that's so that's Bev Thomas 20, but also um, certainly via um, Pamela Dorman um, books is, is, is also an option. And obviously, as soon as my website up and running, that will be on my Twitter feed anyway. Excellent. We're going to send everybody to see you, Bev. It's been a great uh, joy talking with you, and uh, we wish you much success on the book. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to HankGarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. Midnight struck. The Sandman had come. A few faint notes drifted through the rooms of 417 Gorybrook. The hollow wind testing the weatherproofing. The weak scritch of the persimmon tree against Zeph's window and the drone of Hedwig's snoring. The old house shifted, creaked, and the shade of Agatha Van Brunt descended from the attic. Brahm, she called. The ghost paused, collecting herself on the stair. She passed a mirror, but the glass remained empty, reflecting only absence. Agatha would not have recognized herself anyway. She had been beautiful long ago, and still was in her own mind not a toothless and wizened specter, not a blue chalk sketch of a hag half erased from the blackboard of night. She drifted into the master bedroom, disappeared into a shaft of moonbeams, and reappeared on the other side. She stood over Hedwig, listening to him snore. But Hedwig was not Brahm. She needed Brahm. She slipped through the floor into Zeph's bedroom. She stood over him for a long time, listening to the persimmon tree's weak coffin scratch on the window screen. Brahm? No, this was not Brahm. Not Brahm, her son. But she loved this boy. So much hidden potential. He reminded her of Dylan, her grandson. Dylan had slept in this room many, many times. But Dylan was dead, never to return. This boy, Zeph, was alive, so alive. Oh, would that he might remain so forever. Look at him. 
Who would consign such a handsome lad to the rot of death? Only a very cruel and blind god. Agatha brushed her spectral lips to Zeph's cheek. He stirred, scratched the spot, and rolled into his pillow. But Zeph was not Brom. Where? Oh, Brom is dead. She remembered now. Brom is dead, and so are Hermanus, my husband, and Hans, my brother, and old Baltus Van Tassel, and Katrina. All dead. Only old Agatha remains, after a fashion, to trouble the world. Her sense of herself sharpened and returned to her. She searched the rooms for the crane boy. She sensed him. Yes, here was the boy, sleeping fitfully, holding his animal. She extended a hand as if to reach into Jason's chest and take his heart in her talons. The dog woke, sensing Agatha's presence, and growled. Growl till your voice cracks, cur. I could kill this child myself. I could possess the man or the boy. I could take the butcher knife from the drawer. I could stride through the night in strong male form and dissect this child at my whim. Something struck her. Something blasted her up and away from the boy. She collected her energies again and tried to re-enter but could not pass through the walls. When she found her voice, it came as hollow and cold as wind through a tomb. Who is here? Agatha whispered, and her tone might have withered grass. Show yourself. She waited with growing confusion and anxiety. She threw herself forward and battered the door like a tempest. Who is here? she cried. But no one answered. 